Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. We're live, we're interactive. My name is Cyrus Fernando and I'm here every Monday evening at 10 o'clock live and interactive here to take your questions. And each week we've got a very special guest and joining me to answer your questions this week is Dr. Grady McMurtry. Dr. Grady there. I am, sir. Having a great time. <laughs> Thank you so much, as always, Dr. Grady. It looks like you're at home as well. You're always traveling recently, but you're, uh, you're firmly at home in Florida, I believe. I am at the moment. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm sure your wife is happy to, uh, happy to have you. <laughs> well, some of the good news is we're both home, so that's even better. <laughs> oh, bless you, Grady. Now, Grady, we uh, we always try and find interesting topics and articles as well to start the program. And in the meantime, I want to encourage all our viewers as well. Please do send in your questions, whether you've got any questions about the scriptures, Bible interpretation, creation science. Um, Dr. Grady is here. He's a lifelong member of Mensa as well. So lots of information we can share with you uh, this evening. But Dr. Grady, this particular article caught my eye and I'd just love to share it with you. And here it is. A quarter of young Brits are open to banning the Bible. A quarter of young Brits would ban the Bible if they felt its pages contain hateful speech, according to a poll. Last month, polling group Whitestone Insights asked 2,088 UK adults if they agreed with the following statement. Unless the offending parts can be edited out, books containing what some perceive as hate speech should be banned from general sale including, if necessary, religious texts such as the Bible. 23% of young people aged 18 to 34 were most likely to agree with the statement, followed by 17% aged 35 to 54 and 13% of aged over 55s were least likely to agree. And Luis, uh, Luis McLatchy of the Alliance Defending Freedom UK expressed concern about the results. She said the UK only needed to look at Finland to see the consequences of shutting down Christians. Former Minister of the Interior, Pavi Rasanan, has last month acquitted of hate speech charges for the second time after four year legal battle. She was criminally charged after tweeting the Bible verse on marriage. She said, we may no longer be a majority Christian population here in Britain. That's even more reason to protect freedom of speech and belief for all. She said, we are worrying steps towards censorship had already been taken under the Conservative government, including the arrest of street preachers for quoting the Bible in public and pro-life campaigners being taken to court for praying silently in their heads near abortion clinics. So this is the uh, this is the article, Grady. A quarter of young Brits are open to banning the Bible. What do you make out of this one? Well, this is what occurs, of course, when the government has excluded Christianity from the government-controlled school systems, and it has enforced a religion of atheism, and atheism is a religion. Uh, you know, we no longer have freedom of speech in, in the UK, certainly, as far as I can see it, or Finland. And in the United States, we're coming right behind you. You know, the, the secularists, the atheists, the communists, the socialists, are trying to control the education system to the point where the Bible or Christianity is simply eliminated. But the the consequences of eliminating free speech are the enforcement of atheism on a civilization. And that's exactly what we're experiencing. In the United States, our numbers are running very close to yours, just barely behind them. There was a, a announcement today, for instance, that 20% of college graduates at this time don't even believe that the Holocaust occurred. That's here in the States. And another 20% say, well, it occurred, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it's portrayed. Now, this is a control of the education system where they're no longer teaching the truth. They're teaching agendas. So what is the what is the root cause of all of this? We see this Bible is being taken out of every part of our society, out of our governments, out of our schools, every single area. People are getting arrested for praying in silence. Where would this all stop? How can things change, Grady? Well, I, it sounds trite, but the only true solution is to get Christianity back into the majority of the population. We'll, we'll never get 100%. 
But the fact of the matter is, as people have become more lackadaisical in their faith, um, less evangelism is going on, more people uh, are taking a secularist view, the, the atheistic view, and no longer see the Bible as an authority. Now, we're told in the Bible very clearly that if we, we know the Lord, uh, he, he is truth. That's John fourteen six. And that as people no longer use the Bible as a foundation for truth, they're going to get more and more errant in their thinking. And so the secularists have simply taken the population away from being Christian. After all, when you take a look at some of the things that have occurred in England in terms of the, the lack of Christianity, uh, you can see that every social ill comes from it. And I would remind you to look at Romans chapter 1. Paul says, these are the consequences of teaching evolution only in your schools. And so from roughly verse 26, 27 to the end of the chapter, he lists all the things that occur when you take the creator out of the civilization. When the, is the, the article talks about the young Brits are open to banning the Bible, can we be surprised, especially if these young Brits don't have any Christian heritage or have any Christian background or, or relationship in, with God in any way? I mean, just going back to my school days, God was very much in the schools, um, whether it was a Catholic school or Christian school or whatever it is, we would still start with a prayer in the morning and such things as well. And that was really at the forefront, um, even the performances at school in the plays and such things. But now that seems to be removed. So can we really be blaming the young, the young people if they don't have any evidence of having a purpose for Jesus Christ in their lives? Well, it isn't the young people that I blame for their lack of education. What I would say is it's the pulpit, it's the parents. Uh, again, if the pulpit isn't teaching the word and isn't preaching it solidly, you know, rightly dividing the word, then the population doesn't know right and wrong. And if the parents don't take over authority in the house, and then the children don't know the difference between right and wrong. And so they have no standards, no rules, no roles. And what are they going to do? You're going to go to anarchy. And haven't we seen plenty of anarchy in the last five years? Well, when the viewer has written in, Mora has written in to say, homeschooling is the only way to know all the other schools serve the world and not God. Is that also an alternative for our viewers watching now? Homeschooling? Uh, I, I would say that homeschooling is not the only way. I, I, I think we need to clarify that a little bit. But homeschooling is one of the ways in which Christian parents can, in fact, get their children to understand the truth, the truth of right and wrong, the standards by which we're to behave, not only in the family, but with others. Uh, but there are other things, too. I mean, there are solid conservative Christian schools of various kinds that are available to us. Uh, homeschooling is one good option, but it isn't for everybody. Uh, first of all, there are those parents that don't have the discipline or don't have the skills for schooling, uh, and we shouldn't force them then to try to do something that they're not adequately uh, able to do. But it is a good method if you do have the discipline and the skills. Okay, well, the emails are coming in, so thank you to all our viewers, and do continue to write in to the program live at revelationtv.com is the email address, and SMS details are on the program throughout the show as well. Chris, our good friend Chris from Penzance, has written in to say, good evening, Cy and Dr. Grady. My question this evening is about the book of Job, as stated that the book of Job is or may be the oldest book in the Bible. But as we know that the books of the Bible were not written in order, but the book of the Genesis clearly indicates and as it states the creation of the world, that it would be the first book. Or was it written after the book of Job, but kept its authenticity when Moses wrote it at the first three words in the beginning? Um, would suggest that it would be the first book. God bless from Chris. Well, Chris, we need to carefully listen to what I'm about to say. The book of Job is the oldest complete book of the Bible, but it is not the oldest book of the Bible. The book of Job was written 4,000 years ago, roughly 2,000 B.C., about 350 years after the flood of Noah. But the book of Genesis goes all the way back 6,000 years to the Garden of Eden. Now, the book of Genesis was written in sections, and these sections were handed down from trusted people all the way to the time of Noah, then through the flood with him, 
and then on down to Moses, who completed the book of Genesis, but after Job lived. And so while the book of Genesis started at creation 6,000 years ago, it was not completed until the time of Moses. And so Job is the oldest complete book 4,000 years ago, but Genesis is the oldest book, if we take a look at when it started. Jane's written in. She's got two questions, and she said, thank you, Cy and Dr. Grady, for the Q&A program. The first question is this. How do you know if we need to be delivered? <laughs> we all need to be delivered. <laughs> Just like Amazon. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that since we were born with a sinful Adamic nature, uh, we have to fight it every day. Paul talks about his struggles with it, and certainly Paul... Paul, I think, was a finer Christian than most of us could ever hope to be, uh, and yet he struggled with it himself, and he wrote about his own struggles. So do we all need to be delivered? Well, yeah, in a general sense, we do. Now, if you're talking about some specific spiritual need of deliverance, that would be another situation completely. And there you need Christian counseling. There you need to work with strong Christian believers who are mature in their faith, and determine whether you need some special kind of deliverance versus the general kind that we all need. Mm, because the question did go on to say, do all Christians need uh, deliverance as well? Well, as I said, that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need redemption. Uh, the very words themselves refer to that. So we need a Redeemer. We need redemption. Uh, we need a Savior. Uh, someone who can pay for our sins because we cannot. We're not capable of it. We're not capable of being perfect. And God's, God's laws require perfection. Since we can't do it, that's why we need Jesus Christ, who does provide that, that perfect atonement for the sins that we've committed, not he. Okay, this next one is from Woody in Worcestershire, uh, Worcester. Uh, good evening, blessed servants of God. God bless you and your loved ones. Thank you, Woody. Uh, this one says, uh, are we in 1,000 years or does Christ return before the 1,000 years? Well, first of all, that's an eschatological question that we've said many times on the t program that I don't get into the end times. Uh, do I think this is the thousand years at the moment? No, I don't think so. Um, but you're going to get differences of opinion depending upon the specific believer you're listening to and talking with. Uh, we do look like we're headed towards the end times, but again, that may not be true either. Well, Kev in Chepstow's written in. Thanks, Kev, for writing in. Hi, both. Great show as always. How much credence and faith and reliability should we put in Apocrypha? Well, first of all, you have to understand something. The Apocrypha is not considered to be a part of the Word of God, period. Uh, in many Bibles, including the King James and the original 1611 and all the way into the 1800s, the Apocrypha was included between the first and second, the Old and the New Testament. But it was never considered to be a part of the Word of God. It was never considered to be God-breathed. It was not totally authoritative. The reason the Apocrypha was included in between the Old and New Testaments was because they were considered to be books of wisdom, useful, but not God's Word. And so it's unfortunate that they were included uh, because I think it causes some confusion. Uh, obviously, when you have a book that's called Bell and the Dragon, and that comes from Belshazzar, which was the name given to Daniel, for instance, when he was in Persia, um, and the dragon, so on. It, it, it shows you that these are not God-breathed books. But much of the things in them were considered to be useful for education, for learning wisdom, and that's why they were included. How would but you? They are, not, yeah. they are How, not canonical. They are not part of the Word of God. How would you define apocrypha, uh, Grady? Well, anyway, the apocrypha consists of these books, such as uh, Ecclesiasticus, Tobias. Uh, other books that uh, are easily found. And as a matter of fact, as I say, they were even included in the 1611 originally. Um, but they are simply books, the Apocrypha, meaning that they are not equal to the Word of God. They're not part of the canon. That's the important thing. But there's a variety of books easily found, so that I won't go through all of them but they were only considered to be useful for teaching and wisdom, that's all. 
Okay, John in Belfast has written in. Good evening, John. Thank you for writing in. Good, ev good evening, gents. I'm really enjoying the variety of different questions being posed every week and more important, the corresponding answers to them. My question is this. The skull of what can be only described as a colossal seal monster has been found on the coast of Dorset. The two metre long fossil has 130 enormous teeth and experts are highlighting that these remains are at least 150 million years old. This is one of those occasions when science and Christianity are in complete disagreement. If I wasn't a Bible-born a Bible -born believer, there is a strong possibility that I would believe this. How can archaeologists genuinely prove their claim that this skull is 150 million years old when the Earth is only 6,000 years of existence? Can I have your thoughts, please, Dr. Grady? Well, first of all, yes, you, you want to go to places like our website at creationworldview.org. We have a lot of free material as well as material for sale concerning the age of the Earth, age of the universe. And scientifically, it is only 6,000 years old. The millions and billions of years are simply mythology that is required by the religion of atheism to be so, but unprovable and unproven. Now, the skull is quite interesting because what it really proves is the creation is true and that the Earth is only 6,000 years old. Because you'll notice that in the paleontology, not anthropology, but paleontology records, that things used to be bigger, better, faster, smarter than they are today, which shows you a decay process, not a generating creative process. Mm -hmm. You know, if evolution were true, it would be theoretically a creative process with bigger, better, faster things coming along. What we see in the fossils is that things are getting smaller, slower, and dumber, and that's a proof of creation. That's something I want you to remember. But the millions and billions of years are unproven. They are simply philosophically used to support the religion of atheism. Uh, they have absolutely no scientific way of dating anything at 100 million or 200 million years or anything else. Um, all of the radiometric dating processes don't work. We have a lot of free information on that if you go to our website. Uh, and again, we have books and videos for sale as well that would help you. Uh, so you have to understand that you can believe the Bible, that God is recording accurately what he did 6,000 years ago. And because of human sin, things are deteriorating over time. Just give our viewers, we're always getting new viewers on Revelation TV. Just give our viewers a little break, brief. If they've not heard your background before, you know it so well. Why don't you just tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Uh, you do that to me every time. <laughs> Well, I, I was born and raised as an evolutionist, earned my science degrees as an evolutionist, believed it, taught it, but at the age of 27, I became a Christian in a search for truth, and at 28 became a biblical scientific creationist, and I've been speaking on that subject for the last 49 years. The fact of the matter is that initially I believed in millions and millions of years because that's what they told me. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, though, that if you'll take a look at the science, it is easily disproven. Uh, we have what are called geochronometers, meaning Earth time clock or universe time clock. And we have today roughly 450 going towards 500 at the moment, various arguments to prove that it's all young. And again, we have much material on this. Uh, if you go to our website, again, free articles, we have uh, free videos that are short, one minute, two minute, three minute long. And we have uh, on that uh, site, in conjunction with Revelation TV, I would add, uh, what are called Did You Know videos. And uh, today there's right at 400 of them that you can watch. They're very short. And uh, at least half of them deal with arguments as to why the Earth and the universe are young. Now, you are, you, you're also a university lecturer as well in the way that you visit all these universities and you give talks and such things, and you're, that's one of the main reasons you're really constantly travelling around as well. What is the general consensus of what the young people, the students at universities are being taught and believing? Well, again, it depends on which one you go to. You know, there are those universities which are extraordinarily liberal, uh, there are those that are mildly liberal, those that are mildly conservative, those that are very conservative, those that are Christian, those that are not. So it, it, it's not a single statement that you can make. However, at this time, the liberals, the evolutionists, the atheists are in the majority. 
But remember, the truth is not determined by voting. You know, if one person's right and the 99 others in the room are wrong, that doesn't change the truth. And so what's happening today is that because of myself and many, many others, um, we are bringing the truth of creation, the truth of a young earth, the truth that there's no truth to evolution, uh, especially of apes to people. Uh, what's happening is that we are converting even those who are graduate evolutionists. The problem is we can't convert them as fast as they're being put out the door. But we're gaining. Slowly but surely, Grady. Slowly but surely. It's incremental. Mm. So Tinder's written in to say that you're asking about the New Jerusalem. Greetings to you both. I was invited to a Bible study at a church across the road from where I lived recently. And uh, to my surprise, the book they were studying happened to be Dr. Grady's favorite book, the book of Revelation. <laughs> I'll leave it up to Dr. Grady if he wishes to answer this question, but I would appreciate his views. Jesus said that his father's house were many mansions and would GP to prepare uh, the place for us. Does this verse mean the mansions already exist and Jesus will just tailor it to our own specific needs rather than building a mansion from scratch? Blessings from Satinda. First of all, it's a hypothetical question, Satinda, and I don't answer those. Secondly, remember that the word mansions is a particular translation, but it's not the same translation in other languages or even in other English translations. Some say houses, some say mansions. I, I, isn't it more important that you get there rather than what that particular word refers to? Good point. Very interesting. Uh, Therese has written in to say, dear friends, thank you for answering previous questions. To what extent is climate change uh, man-made and how does the world's increasing temperature link to Jesus's second coming? Grady, your favorite topic, climate change. Tell us more. <laughs> oh, I love it. I continue to, to uh, modify my presentations on that. Yeah. You recently Human attended the COP28, is that right? No. <laughs> Go ahead, Ladies go and gentlemen, ahead. that that was tongue in cheek. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot I can say about that. I believe, believe me. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I thought that was extremely funny about even the location. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, humans have nothing to do with global warming or global cooling. And for a Bible believing Christian, there's at least three dozen verses of the Bible where God says He's in charge of the weather, starting with Genesis 8:22. And I take you and suggest you go to Amos 4 and many other places. However, uh, humans have really no control over weather or climate long term. What you're seeing are natural things that occur. The earth has been warming and cooling for thousands of years for very well known and scientifically documented reasons. Um, the earth is not hotter. The, 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 I saw this article, of course, I'm sure you're referring to it. So this is going to be the hottest year on record. Well, that is a bunch of baloney. You could open a deli store with that one. The fact of the matter is we know that the earth has been much warmer than today during the medieval warm period, during the Roman warm period, during the um, warm period called the Mycenaean warm period by some. You and I might call it the Moses Joshua warm period. But we have had much warmer temperatures on Earth than today. This is not the hottest time ever. And CO2 is a gas that does cause slight warming in the atmosphere. Um, however, it's very mild. And the increase that we have right now is no big deal. Uh, right now we're at about um, 420 parts per million. Um, but it's no big deal whatsoever. And the fact of the matter is that sunspot activity and volcanic activity have far more to do with global warming, global cooling than the humans ever could. We don't have the power to change it. And so we have an uh, article on our website. We have presentations. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be doing it again in January and just did it twice this fall uh, here in the States. Um, but there, there's no truth to humans controlling the, and, and these trillions of dollars that are being asked of us to spend will have no net effect whatsoever. OK, maybe you'll be invited to the next cop as the head speaker, Grady. Who knows? Well, it'd be a lot better than Lurch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Michael's written in from uh, Penzance in Cornwall. 
Uh, hi, good evening. Just an email to wish everyone a blessed time at the moment. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we enjoy Middle East updates and have two friends from the, who are thoroughly enjoying Revelation TV. Thank you so much for your programmings. God bless from Michael. God bless you too, Michael. Thank you. Uh, this next one here is from Ty to say good evening, gents. Could I ask Dr. Grady what happens to our spirit when we sleep? Well, it's still in your body. That's where it, that's where it is as long as you're alive. You are a triune being. Your body, soul, and spirit, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So your body remains in your, your spirit, remains in your body even when you are asleep. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay, this one's from Anne, and she says, I'm first time emailing in, so congratulations and welcome, Anne. She's got a few questions here, and I'll read them all out, and then I'll read one by one if needed. She says this, um, two questions, one where it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? And then it's she says, about... sorry, and she says, does it mean if we all allow sickness on earth? We allow sickness in heaven, and when we die, are we the same age as we are on the earth as we are younger? There you go. Buddy. Okay, well, first of all, what is being referred to there is God's, God's uh, rules, laws, roles, etc., the standard of perfection. Now, there will be perfection in heaven, but of course, because of human sin, though we started in perfection initially, because of human sin that made the entire universe imperfect, and it's becoming more and more imperfect as we go. So Jesus is praying that, that in fact, in the ultimate long term, that perfection will be restored. And uh, that's even talked about a little bit in Second Peter chapter 3. Um, the second part of the question, Cyrus, was... Does it mean that we're, if we allow sickness on earth, we allow sickness in heaven? And if we die, are we the same age as we were on, he yeah, on earth or are we younger? Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to. First of all, uh, again, no, the state of God's uh, standard is perfection. And Jesus is talking about the restoration of perfection. That, that the effects of human sin will be done away with. Now, as to the age we die and what we look like, uh, I don't know, haven't gotten there yet, though I'm getting closer. The fact of the matter is, though, um, I doubt it, but that's just a personal opinion. But we don't know. We do know that in a glorified body that we will recognize each other, uh, that we will recognize the people that we knew, um, but whether God restores us all to the age of 21 or not, I don't know. But I would say that we don't maintain the age at death because, for instance, let's say a baby died at six months. It would not be able to communicate. It wouldn't have the thought processes that would allow it to communicate. So when they go to heaven, they will be able to communicate, and therefore they must at least be, shall we say, at the age of 21, <laughs> mature adult, uh, but doesn't talk about age in the sense of whether it's 18 or 56. Mm. Interesting. Thank you, Grady. This one's from our friend Dave. Dave's written in to say hi to you both, Dr. Grady. About 18 months ago, you showed a picture of a tree trunk buried under several layers of rock soil, etc. You gave an explanation as why it was not millions of years old. Where can I find that particular video? Would that be on your website, maybe? Oh, yes, you can find it on our website. Uh, I think you're talking about the one that comes from a video we have called My Favorite Fossil, which are polystrate fossils. And that's what that sounds like to me. Although we do also show polystrate fossils in some of the other presentations. So we have one that's only about polystrate fossils. But we also use those in the Dynamania presentation, for example. Uh, we mentioned it in some other places because it's really, really great evidence for a worldwide flood and a young earth. Uh, when you have tree trunks that are even up to 80 feet long, and you might even be referring to our presentation on, say, Mount St. Helens, where we do talk about them. Um, but sometimes they're upside down, but they don't have tops, they don't have roots, they penetrate many layers of the fossil record, could not possibly have lived in these positions without tops or bottoms for millions of years, especially upside down. I mean, that's the really ridiculous one. 
uh, but it shows the results of a worldwide flood in a young Earth. But we, we have a whole presentation on them, my favorite fossil, my favorite kind of fossil, and we also include them in several presentations. Wonderful. Thank you, Grady. This next one here is from Paul. To say hi, Dr. Grady and Cy. Uh, Peter, uh, Paul in Sheffield. Good evening. Have you heard of Sefer Bible? And uh, if so, can you please comment on it? Sefer Bible. Uh, I don't think so. C-E-P-H-E-R. Sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. No problem. Let's uh, have a look at the next one. Rob's written in to say, what is the most accurate translation of the Bible? The most accurate translation of the Bible is in the original languages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to say it. But, you know, it, again, it depends on which language you're talking about, too, because, for instance, in English, we've got about 122,000 different translations. Um but, you know, every language, for instance, in Spanish, there's several different translations. In Portuguese, there's different translations. In Russian, there's different translations. So you can't say which one's the best. What you can say is that there are sections of various Bibles that are better than others. So I'm going to make my answer more to the English language only. Now, in the English language only, again, there is no perfect translation unless you read the original languages and you have a true understanding of the vocabulary of the original languages, uh, then you have to deal with the translation, and you always lose something in translation. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. Today, in the English language, I use the New American Standard as perhaps one of the best, but it is not perfect mm. by any stretch of the imagination. It is superior to various other translations, or especially paraphrases and that kind of thing. I would clearly stay away from a paraphrase. I would clearly stay away from a dynamic translation if you can and try to stick with a true translation. But there are different qualities. And as I said, in the English language, I use the New American Standard as my main study Bible, but I also look at the others too. What are your thoughts on the New King James Version of the Bible, Grady? Oh, it's, it's totally adequate. I mean, the King James was a pretty good translation 400 years ago. But the problem is, of course, that um, there was not perfect understanding of some of the other words that are in the Bible, um, and spellings, archaic terminology, the Shakespearean poetic nature of the 1611, um, the New King James helped to clarify some of that. Yeah. Uh, but but the original King James, with the these and the thous, if you understand that, uh, was still a good translation. Mm. Uh, I use the New American Standard because words do change meaning over time, uh, even though it was a very good translation at the time. Um, and so as words change meaning over time, what I want is the best current nuance. I, I don't want simply a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, I kind of alluded to that a little earlier in the program. So what I want is the, the best conceptual translation. And the New King James um, certainly is a good translation. I put it amongst the top translations. Um, I would, again, prefer the New American. Um, many translations, though, are done, say, at the sixth or the eighth grade uh, level of word usage, whereas the New American is at the senior high school level uh, of nuance. And that's the kind of precision that I would want. What do you make out of the NIV, or what would you even recommend for anyone picking up the Bible for the first time? Well, I did a half an hour teaching on how to pick a Bible, and I include things like this. Now, I do not use, nor would I recommend the NIV as a main study Bible. Uh, if you need to use it to kind of get into the Bible and what it's trying to say, and then you're willing to move up and leave it behind, that might be helpful. But the problem with the NIV is it's a dynamic translation. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. It's a dynamic translation where they attempt to take clauses and uh, portions of sentences or entire sentences and try to translate them in some complete way where they're not translating the text directly. Uh, this is why I would not use it. And I would point out that the people who originally published the NIV and other versions uh, even came out with the gender-neutral version, which is, to my way of thinking, absolutely anathema. 
And so that's why I would not do it. Interesting. Thank you so much indeed for that very good insight, Grady. Uh, Bill in Northern Ireland has written in. Uh, hi, Dr. Grady and Cyrus. Just wondering what our friends and relations have um, that have died and gone to heaven would be doing now in heaven. Well, again, we don't know exactly, although the Bible does give us some insights. Now, uh, those that are in heaven will know those that they knew in, in, in life. Uh, we will be able to communicate. We will think. We will learn. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things I point out is that uh, one of the things we're going to do is God is going to reveal new things about himself to us for an eternity future. Uh, we will have useful work to do. Uh, we know this because we know that uh, there will be different gradations of authority. Uh, just as the Bible talks about, you'll be over one, you'll be over two, you'll be over five. Um, there's different crowns that you'll have as rewards for your life on earth. Uh, and so there's going to be activity, there's going to be a useful work, there's going to be a learning um, we don't know the totality of it, but we do know that some of those things are certainly true. This one's from Brian to say, uh, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Have you any thoughts as to what Daniel meant in Daniel 12, 12, when he said, bless is he that waiteth and cometh unto the 1,335th of days, and who in who the 1,335 of days might be referring to? Well, I would suggest to you that's referring to the coming of Jesus. Uh, Daniel, personal opinion here, Daniel to me is the single greatest individual prophet of the, all the prophets of the Old Testament. Now, that is not to negate any of them. They are all prophets of God. They are all equal in status as prophets, but some wrote more than others. You know, so the, the three major prophets versus what we call the minor prophets is only the size of the book. It's not the significance of the person or the amount of revelation they were given by God. But Daniel prophesied basically um, not, well, over 500 years. We'll put it that way. Over 500 years, prophesied the exact year, the exact month, and the exact day that Jesus would be selected as the Lamb of God. Uh, to me, that is perhaps the single greatest prophecy of the old, entire Old Testament, other than the fact that, that a Savior would come, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but it's one thing to have a prophet that says that a virgin is going to give birth, which is a really heavy-duty prophecy. It's quite another to say when it's going to happen. And Daniel was exact and specific. And he was absolutely on the money. Joy has written in asking, is the New Living Translation Bible okay to use? Well, again, here you're not dealing with a direct translation. So, uh, again, if you're a new Christian, and if the, the higher level, better quality translations are a little heady for you, you need to start somewhere. And so if that's what you need to kind of get a gist of things uh, until you start learning more about Christianity, and then you will and are willing to go up to a better translation, then that's fine. But don't stay there. This one's from Dawn to say, uh, some say that we should not call the Father or the Trinity God or Jesus Lord. Their roots are from evil. That Baal was called God. Some say that it is a Hebrew's translation from God um, and that he should use their Hebrew names, Yahweh and uh, Yeshiva, and that the letters adds up to significant numbers. Also, that Christians have forgotten these things, that our creator prefers the, the Hebrew words to address him, to say that our creator would prefer to be called. Many blessings from Dawn. What are your thoughts on that one? I think that's a way too legalistic for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Why? <laughs> uh, first of all, God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you are using an English translation, that's easy to prove. For instance, as in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, 
the Holy Spirit of the Father God is upon me, the Son, for example. Or in Psalms, when David writes about, my Lord said to my Lord, meaning the Father said to the Son. Um, John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'll pray to the Father, he's going to send you another, meaning equal but different, and then says she's the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit of God, that will be with you uh, on earth until the end of time. Uh, he will be with you and in you. And, and so there's many references to the triune nature of God in both the Old and New Testament. Um, again, uh, we cannot force the Hebrew language on everybody. People aren't going to learn Hebrew. They're going to learn their, first of all, native tongue, whatever that might be. And I think that the Lord knows all the words. Therefore, if we call him Isa in one language and Yeshua in another, Jesus in another, uh, he knows what we're talking about, and we are being just as respectful uh, in one as the other. More was written in to say, uh, Grady's always tell the gospel truth in a clear way, and thank God for men like Grady. Ah, uh. well, bless your heart and a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful, Grady. Deborah's written in. Debs is written in. Good evening, brothers. I missed the first um, beginning of the program, but I'm recording anyway, as always. So much rich information on your programs. Uh, my question is, are Israel God's firstborn? Is that why he, was, uh, he has a covenant with them over his other children? Also, why won't Egypt open the gates in Gaza so civilians, women and children can be held safe camps outside the war zone where aid actually is? I don't understand that at all. It's like they're helping Hamas propaganda. Why do both sides keep repeating this insanity? Obviously, I bless Israel, but I think Jesus would open the gate. What do you think from Debs? So shall we do the first part of the question, Grady? And saying, my question is, are Israel God's firstborn? And is that why he has a covenant with them over other children? Well, Jesus is God's firstborn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to start with. <laughs> Good one. And Israel is simply a name that was given, uh, Prince of, of God there. Um, however... Uh, the Jews were the chosen people. That's what we need to change our terminology a little bit there. Why Egypt will not uh, or does not desire to have uh, the people who live in, in the Gaza Strip is that while they are technically both Muslims, um, Egypt does not want uh, all of the, the crime, uh, the terrorism, etc., that would come from the people that live in Gaza into Egypt. So what they're trying to do is keep a cancer out of their own land, and I'm totally in favor of that. Uh, here in the States, we've allowed over 7 million people, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to a very liberal administration, to come into this country bringing disease and ideologies, which are a cancer now in our land. And uh, as a matter of fact, recent announcements about even bringing in more recently ticks with disease across the southern border. But we've had everything from polio to all kinds of other things. But even worse than that is the criminal activity, the amount of terrorists that we've actually arrested at the border, uh, the amount of uh, child molesters, pedophiles um, that we've allowed across the border. I mean, the list just goes on. And Egypt's in the same situation with the people that live in Gaza. Um, it's much as when the Jews came up to the border uh, under Joshua and went into the Promised Land. The Canaanites were there. They were the worst people in that area of the world at that time. They were still sacrificing babies alive. And God didn't commit genocide. They told them, you have to voluntarily leave because this does not belong to you. I gave it to the Jews. And so we take a look at these various national borders and the various reasons why, for instance, Egypt would not want these people from Gaza coming into the country. And it applies to all other countries, too. You don't want criminals. You don't want disease, et cetera, to come into your land. And you don't want ideologies that do not agree with your own. Okay, well, Toyin's written in to say good evening. I would like to know 
when I go to meet the Lord, if all my books I have not had time to read on earth will be available for me to read in heaven. Also, I love sports and need to know how I can still play squash, tennis and dance. Thank you, Dr. Grady, for everything you do on the channel. That's from Toyin. <laughs> I love it. The fact, the fact of the matter is, there's not a biblical basis that I can think of. <laughs> what verse is that? Playing. Yeah. Yeah that we would be playing sports in heaven, but that doesn't preclude the fact we might. Yeah. <laughs> just, I can't get any biblical basis for it, so though. So there is hope. There is hope. And Well, but I was going to say, in heaven, are we really going to be concerned about that? That's true. You know, you know in, in heaven, are those, those things that we like now here in, in the physical realm, are those really going to be things that we are concerned about in heaven or would it even appeal to us, you know? Uh, that they will become things of the past that are no longer influencing us at that time. But the Bible doesn't say specifically. Um, so I don't know. Okay. This next one here is uh, no name on it, but it says, Dr. Grady, will Mr. Trump return to the White House or will Sleepy Joe do another term if he stays awake? Oh, bless him. God bless Joe Biden. <laughs> Let us say that I would hope that any of the leading Republicans at this time would get in the White House versus Mr. Biden. Is it that bad? Oh, it's that bad. Yeah, I it's thought that. so. I thought so. Uh, I don't know how many people in, in the UK watched the movie Home Alone, yes. the first one. Yes. <laughs> but in that movie, um, the boy is left behind, yes. supposedly by accident. That's the plot. And uh, and he goes to the grocery store with a twenty dollar bill. Yeah. And he buys uh, nineteen dollars and change worth of stuff, food that he needed, and even laundry detergent, etc. Last year, under Biden's inflation, uh, that would have cost you forty four dollars. Wow. This year, it costs over seventy. So you get to see that that uh, Mr. Biden, the far left, uh, the environmental terrorists, etc., are destroying the United States economically. Wow! They are spending beyond any reasonable nature. Uh, they are incurring debts that we cannot repay. The Bidenomics is just Biden inflation. And it is ruining the American lifestyle. It is ruining the United States. And it will ruin the UK. It will ruin any country where these kinds of things are practiced. Uh, it is absolutely communist and the ruination of a country when you put these economic policies in place. Just for our viewers to gain an insight into the economy of the US in practical terms, let's say the average household, let's say you and your wife, what would be the average weekly shopping, food shopping in a supermarket? What would you spend every week? Well, <laughs> Just on average. I, well, well, I was going to say, I don't know the exact uh, amounts, but I, I reflect about this with my wife, as a matter of fact, even just this week. Mm. When I was in graduate school getting my master's in 1969 and 1970, um, I, was, I was getting half scholarship, half work. And my wife had a job, um, and we were able to buy a week's worth of groceries for twenty-five dollars. Okay. Today, today, you know, it, it's much closer to one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And so that just that just shows you the rapid pace of inflation, which was totally unnecessary. You know, un under Mr. Trump. And his four years, we were having inflation at two, three percent a year. Now we've got it at twenty, thirty percent a year. We cannot continue that. No one can continue that. And when you take a look at some of the other countries whose inflation rates are even worse, this is why nations collapse. That's why Venezuela collapsed, for instance. So just taking it down, really dumbing it down for us, for me as well. Let's say now you're spending $120 a week on weekly on a shopping, on an average shop. When Trump was in presidency, how much would you have been spending then? Oh, probably much closer to somewhere in the areas of 75. Wow. Just to give perspective. I mean, it, it, yeah. three, three, three years has absolutely ruined us. Wow. This runaway uh, spending causes runaway inflation. 
uh, I think Margaret Thatcher had a really good handle on it, which says ultimately you run out of other people's money. Grady, we've got about six minutes to go. Let's see if we can get through some more emails. Anthony's written in to say, if you sin whilst you dream, uh, very, very vivid dreams, do you need to re your repent? Uh, as we at the end of the day are in the us, uh, us dreaming, so we're responsible. Talking about your dreams, do you need to repent? That's from Anthony. Well, because <laughs> first of all, when you sleep, the mind continues to run. It's, it's it's like a car and an engine. What happens is when you're awake, the engine's running and the transmission is engaged and the wheels are turning. When you go to sleep, the the clutch goes out and the transmission and the wheels stop, but the engine keeps running. And the mind is a very fertile and creative place. Now, if you are having dreams, and frankly, I, I really don't remember them, and most people don't, but some do. And if you're having dreams that disturb you, the first thing you have to say is, Satan, get behind me. You know, take authority over your thoughts from a godly perspective. And if you can't do it on your own, you ask for, you know, God's help. You ask Jesus, help me to not have those kind of dreams. I don't want them. Uh, it isn't God honoring. It's not doing me any good. Uh, it's doing me harm. And so I'm asking if I can't do it with my own control, that, that you would help me to do it. Mm. And, uh, you know, if, if Adam and Eve... Uh, we're not immune to Satan putting thoughts in their minds. We aren't either. The question is, what do you do with them? And so what you do with them is you say, get behind me, Satan, and I'm not going to allow these things to happen. I'm not going to allow you to come in. That's why the, the helmet of salvation surrounds the brain, mm. it's to prevent these thoughts from being put into our mind. So dwell on the Word of God, and when you're asleep, try to dwell on the Word of God. Amen. Good, good inspirational and good words of wisdom. Dr. Grady, according to this viewer, has written a text message. The NIV for them stands for not inspired version. That's from one of our viewers. Okay. Heard it many times. <laughs> this next one's written in to say, uh, hello, Revelation TV. Recently, I've been thinking about a lot about Arabic land and their oil fields. Could you ask Dr. Grady if this is where Eden was before the first sin and when Eden was cut off from Adam and Eve, was all those trees and forests covered by sand? And that is from Stephen. Well, the, let's go backwards here. Uh, what was the Garden of Eden? Uh, if you had a G GPS, you could find the, the location, but you wouldn't find anything there because it was completely and utterly erased by the flood of Noah. Scraped clean and then buried in the sedimentary layers, which I think is what you're referring to. Secondly, uh, the oil comes from the flood of Noah. When trapped vegetation, billions and billions of trees and other vegetation uh, was um, died and then buried between sedimentary layers, um, so that that's simply the result of the flood. It's not because that's where the Garden of Eden was. I would say that biblically, uh, there is every reason to believe that the center of the Garden of Eden is where Jerusalem is today. Uh, I'm not saying that to to try to um, push some agenda. I'm simply saying that biblically, that that's what it appears to be. And that is Jesus uh, died and was resurrected at what was then the center of the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Eden itself doesn't exist uh, and didn't exist when Jesus died either. Okay, Richard's written, we've got about two minutes to go, Grady. Uh, Richard emailing from Luth Lulworth. Really enjoying the program this evening and thank you both for a great godly work. Uh, can I ask Dr. Grady if he has any scriptural wisdom on what we should be done on the physical body after death, whether it should be burial or cremation? Oh, we had that question just, uh, what, a week or two ago. Yeah. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, the important thing is to honor the body. Uh, you, you clean it properly, and you have a memorial service in whatever method you choose that's appropriate. Uh, but whether the body is buried or cremated, ultimately the same thing occurs. You know, uh, you come from dust, you go to dust, ashes to ashes. Um, cremation is simply a fast way of going to ashes, whereas being buried is a slow way of going to ashes. But the exact same thing will take place. 
And so it's, the important thing is to, to honor the body that was the house of the person you knew, relative or friend. Um, honor it with proper ceremony. Uh, but whether it's cremated or buried is not the relevant question. Grady, we started the program asking the question and showing their article talking about a quarter of young Brits believe that we need to be banning the Bible. What message of hope can we give to our viewers today that we can get God back into our society? Well, that is the, what we want to challenge the audience from RTV to do. You know, we are to do the work of the ministry, not, not just simply the, the pastor. And it's because Christians have, you know, prevented themselves from doing it by adopting some other activities. But the real thing is we need to get the word of Christ out. We need to get the word of God out. We need to evangelize because if we could bring people back into the kingdom of God, many of these problems would be erased and go away. Amen. Dr. Grady McMurtry, thank you as always for joining us. We look forward to having you on the program next time. God bless you, Grady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our viewers as well. Thank you for all of your interaction. As always, we're here every Monday evening on Revelation TV at 10 o'clock live. And if you want to watch this program again or send it to your friends and family, go on to our website, revelationtv.com slash videos. No matter what you're going through in your life, I pray that you have some light in your darkness. Just trust in God, trust in Jesus, that he has a plan for your life and he will help you guide you just just leave your hands in your life in his hands no matter what's going on trust in the lord jesus christ i pray that for you today take care god bless and we'll see you next time bye bye bye